Welcome back from the break. Now it's time to switch from controllers that have all the information to controllers that work in real time and have limited information about the future. Before going into it, we just make a short repetition of some of the main concepts that we have seen. We have looked at the hybrid electric vehicles and the parallel hybrid where we have two parallel energy paths. One one-way path that goes from the fuel tank out to the wheels and then one two-way path where that goes from the battery to the wheel and vehicle and from the wheel and vehicle back into the battery again. So we can do regenerative braking and we can do load shifting etc. Et then we have the series hybrid vehicle where we have one path going from the fuel combustion engine generator in power electronics battery and out to the wheels and here we have one part that is one way and one part here so that is two way and in between them we have the power electronics and the battery in this case we have two degrees of freedom so we have two possible ways of playing with energy we have one part that is the kinetic energy of the engine that we can optimize in terms of where we place the operating points. Another degree of freedom here is the storage of the battery. We have also been talking about optimization and one example that we haven't dived deep into but we have mentioned is that for a conventional vehicle you have a gearbox and when you're looking at the drive cycle you would like to minimize the fuel over the drive cycle we need to use the gears but we haven't specified the gear ratios so this can be specified as an optimization problem and what we're doing in that case is that we are looking at the decision variables that are countably many so we have five decision variables and we have a computable cost in traditional calculus courses it's a function that we can calculate by evaluating that function but you can also think of a computable cost as something that the computer can calculate and in this case the computable cost is computed from one QSS simulation of the model. With a setting of the five gears we get from the QSS tool a mass of fuel that that setting gives and then inside this we have a computable set of constraints which is that the vehicle model needs to be fulfilled and the cycle needs to be followed during the driving. There we have a setting with a little bit more advanced system setup than we are normally used to in optimization and in the classical courses. But it's still the same principle. We have something that we want to minimize. It's the fuel here. We can compute it and we can see whether or not it fulfills the constraints. And in normal optimization we have this finite number of variables that we're optimizing over. In this case they are only five but in big scale problems you can have tens or hundreds of thousands of decision variables. When we jump to optimal control then the cost function is still scalar. We have only one value that we're optimizing. If we would optimize in different domains then it is multi-criteria optimization and you have to determine what criteria is the most important or the weight between them. How to weight fuel versus cost of something. And in this case the mass fuel here is given as a function of where we're driving and how much we are requesting from the engine in terms of torque. This is the fuel flow into the engine that is time continuous variable. And we're now searching for the curve for the control signal. This is a curve that has values for each instant of time. So now we are searching a curve. The control might jump but it's still a curve. You have infinitely dense points in that curve. And the constraints in optimal control are the differential equations, for example, that the Newton's second law must be fulfilled. And we have the relation here also between the integration of the velocity becomes the distance traveled. And we set up constraints that we must start in point A and at the end point with a fixed time we need to be at point B. The time could also be relaxed so that we are setting the time 
free and then we can have a minimum time problem or we can have minimum energy problem with end time free. In many cases in optimal control we are also looking at bounded controls which is close to what we have in reality. All actuators that we're using are limited in one way or the other. Then we have the speed limits that we also have to fulfill and these are called path constraints. So this is initial constraint and this is end constraint and these are path constraints that must be fulfilled for the full path of the solution. And the main things is that we have the infinite dimensional variable and we have the differential equations in the background. And we have gone into it with the parallel hybrid with the different modes where we look at how to control it with respect to the power delivered from the battery in relation to the power requirement that the vehicle has in the driving. And we look at the different modes, we have zero emission vehicle mode where we are running all electric. Then we have battery recharge mode when we are recharging the battery. And we are looking at power assist mode when we are doing boosting, we are helping the combustion engine with additional electricity. And we are doing regenerative braking or we are using it in conventional vehicle mode, so we are running the vehicle on the engine. With the toolbox that you have received in the course, you can now solve these problems. So you can get the solution and you can analyze it to see what is the optimal behavior over the cycle. And you have seen also now more examples of how you can use dynamic programming in other settings. It's a useful tool and it's used very often thanks to the fact that it guarantees the global solution within the discretization. You have also seen the drawbacks that when you go up in dimension then it has the curse of dimensionality it has exponential complexity with the number of continuous dimensions that you need to discretize to get a good solution if we look at it in the power split range so you have the control unit so this is an example of the qss where you have a hybrid electric vehicle in this case we're running a simulation but we're not utilizing the information of the driving profile in the control unit. We are selecting the control strategy just here. And the control strategy could be implemented by a heuristic approach or an approach that has been determined more systematically through, for example, optimal control. How should we split the power here between these two? And we also have the possibility to have clutch engagement and disengagement and engine engagement and disengagement. In the management of the system it's important to know the charge level of the battery. So then it might be a good option to utilize the electric machine. But if we have low energy levels in the battery it might be necessary to utilize the combustion engine and maybe charge the battery. So in the power split controls we have the different modes, internal combustion engine, running the engine. Then we have zero emission vehicle where we are decoupling the engine. And we have the power assist mode and we have recharge mode and we have regenerative braking where we are taking all the energy into the battery. The goal now is to develop control structures that determines which of these modes should we operate in. When we talk about these controllers we can classify them in different classes. One is non-causal controllers that have information about the future and they can have detailed knowledge about the future driving situation like those that we have with the given driving cycles. So for example with the given driving cycles we can test the what if questions. What is the best we can do when we have all information. Then we have information about position, speed, altitude, traffic situations and this is becoming more and more available now. The uses of it is that you can use it to analyze the optimal behavior over the regulatory drive cycles and you can use that as benchmarking against the controller that you have developed. You could also add public transportation where you have a given route or long haul operation when you're driving the same route over and over again the same time of day. And you have also the GPS based route planning where you have information, for example, from Google Maps or other things. 
you use the route and you use prediction of the traffic situation, how it will be when you arrive to the city limits at that time of day. So with more information available, you can make better plans and utilize the energy in a better way. Then you have causal controllers that doesn't have information about the future. They only use the information about the current state when they make decision about the control action. And that's what we would call the normal controller. For example, state feedback controller or regular PI controllers or other online controllers in vehicle without the planning. Another way to look at them is to look at the, the technology behind them. You, for example, have heuristic controllers that rely upon heuristic rules. They are usually causal because they're using the state and then they are relying on some heuristic like I told you earlier. If the battery state of charge is high then use electric machine for propulsion. If the battery state is low then use combustion engine etc. This is state of the art in most uh, prototypes and mass production where they want to make sure that the controller will always give you a decision in the given time. Then you have optimal controllers and to be optimal they need to have full information and they are often non-causal. There are some causal solutions that we will look at in the coming slides and that's the equivalent consumption minimization strategy. Then we have suboptimal controllers. They are using optimization at different levels to solve smaller sub-problems and put the smaller sub-problems into the bigger controller and they are often causal, so they can be run in real time. There is an ongoing work to include the optimal controllers in production vehicles. Some comments about the importance of this problem is very important for the industry. It's an area of competition. You're competing in terms of fuel economy and it's a difficult problem to solve. That's also why it's of such a high interest. And the true optimal controller for causal controllers is for the general case an unsolved problem because you don't have the information about the future. There is a rich body of engineering reports and research papers on the subject and you can clearly see this if you read chapter 7 inside the book. And it has been the main research area of the authors Lina Gutzella and Antonio Chiaretta and I have also been working in this area. We look shortly at heuristic control approaches. In the heuristic control approaches we have rules that depend on a few vehicle operation parameters. It's usually nested if then else clauses. If velocity is low then use the electric motor else then you go with a combustion machine. So you have nested if then else then you could have fuzzy based controllers that rely upon the methodology of fuzzy logic to deliver the control logics where you work with classification of the operating conditions into fuzzy sets and then you make rules for the control output for each mode and then you use the defuzzification step to give the control output. When we look at the heuristic control approaches we have velocity in one direct dimension, we have the torque request in one direction and we have the state of charge and the power which in a sense is a little bit similar to the torque. If you look at this graph here you can recognize here the electric machine characteristics and here you can see it when it's used as regenerative braking. So in this region you use regenerative braking and then beyond the power capabilities of the generator you're using active braking and in this case here we are using all electric drive when we have low velocity and we have a low torque request but when the torque request comes up and we would like to do maybe a, a tough acceleration then the engine is kicked in and we are using the blender strategy and when we are running here up at high speeds perhaps represented by highway driving then the combustion engine is used by itself when the state of charge is very high then we use the all electric drive up to a certain point and beyond that point the electric machine might not be able to deliver the power so we blend it in 
and in this region with a fairly high state of charge but normal state of charge we're using only the combustion engine and when we come down here to low state of charge then we use the recharging of the battery and up here we're using a blended mode where we are mixing the um, energy from the combustion engine and the electric machine and regenerative braking we use only the electric machine and beyond the power limit of the electric machine we need to use active braking like this illustrates we're using the control output as function of some selected state variables like vehicle speed engine speed state of charge power demand motor speed and then there can be temperature vehicle accelerations and torque demand so beyond the, what you have seen here temperature is important to monitor in a practical application because it will dictate the limitations that we have on the battery in some cases we're not allowed to take out all the electric energy that it could provide because it might degrade the battery and make it age faster than it should the heuristic control approaches they are easy to conceive you can think them up and they are relatively easy to implement but the results depend on the thresholds for example where do we place the different thresholds here and the different thresholds for these ones so the results will depend on how we are tuning the thresholds and proper tuning can give good fuel consumption reduction and charge sustainability and performance will vary with the cycle and the driving condition so they might not be robust so they might give very good on one cycle and less performance on other cycles they're time consuming to develop and tune for advanced hybrid vehicle configurations when you have a lot of different options to choose from when you have high flexibility in your driveline coming to the optimal control strategies there the goal is to develop a systematic procedure for getting the control action in place we start by remembering what we're controlling we have two graphs this one here is the total consumption of fuel mass and this thicker line here is the state of charge that goes up and down over the driving depending on the accelerations and decelerations that aren't seen here but we have the net storage and we have the net depletion of the battery state of charge and if we have a charge sustaining strategy the end point here should be here but the state of charge is a state and the consumed fuel is usually our criterion that can also be modeled as a state when we formulate the optimal control problem we look at what is the desired behavior and this defines our performance for example minimizing the fuel consumption from starting time to the final time is a pretty straightforward formulation of the optimal behavior then we could also make a balance between the fuel consumption and the emissions that are coming out where we have these weighting factors to tell how important are hydrocarbons, how important are NO, how important are carbon monoxide if we look at the polluting emissions that are harmful to human beings. At this moment the three-way catalyst is doing such a good job so this is usually not something that you need to work with but it's something that needs to be considered and is done when you use a hybrid and you go all electric drive for quite some time then if you do a lot of electric drive but start the engine only a few times then you will have a lot of cold starts and those cold starts could give rise to high emissions because it's the cold starts of hybrid electric vehicles that gives emissions then you could also include a drivability criteria and this is called uh, vehicle jerk related to the jerky movement of the vehicle and this could be used to balance the fuel economy and the drivability or the feeling of the vehicle in the course we're focusing on the fuel consumption to minimize the energy usage in another electromobility setting we could focus on the total energy that is used in the course we are looking at that the driving cycle is specified we don't have any freedom in that sense our freedom is how we can use the electric energy in the battery the focus is also on hybrid vehicles that need to be charge sustaining so that we have 
a constraint on the state of charge. Then plug-in hybrid can be treated similarly, where we are saying that the state of charge should follow a certain discharge profile. So it should evolve over time and at the end of the route where we have a charging opportunity be empty. When we look at this, we can look at it from two points and that's uh, to look at the constraint. If we formulate it like this, minimize the fuel under this constraint condition, then we have what's called a hard constraint. But we can also include a soft constraint where we are giving a function that uh, penalizes deviations. For example, if we have a deviation that the final state of charge is bigger than the initial state of charge, that might be beneficial or even desirable. But the other way around, if the state of charge at the end point is smaller than the um, initial, then the strategy is not charge sustaining. So that means that we will have to spend fuel in the future to charge it up. So that's not so good. But the one question is, how do we select it? In many engineering cases, you penalize a deviation between your desired point and your final point. And uh, this one penalizes high deviations more than small, and it's independent of sign. While if we look at it from this way, where we have a weighting factor, that penalizes the deviation between these two variables. By selecting a bigger final state of charge, so we're using more fuel, we can get some benefits. But if we're ending at a lower state of charge, then this penalizes that. If we are perfect with the state of charge, then we have uh, this one. While if we have used more electrical energy, so this one has been lowered, then this one is adding things to it. So we are worsening the condition for the minimization. And on the opposite side, if we have added a bit extra of the state of charge, then that means that we can utilize electrical energy in the future. So we can avoid fuel usage. So we we'll look at this last one and it's a special feature. So this one can be written like this and we can rewrite this. So if you look at it from this perspective, you see that we have the derivative of the state of charge and that's uh, when we take the primitive function of that, we get this. That means that we can rewrite our cost function to this. So we have the integration from zero to final time over our fuel cost minus this Q over T that comes from this state here. This is now similar to the method of Lagrangian multiplier that I shortly mentioned in the first hour. The state equation is also included. So we, what we're monitoring in these problems is our degree of freedom is a state of charge and the rest is more or less fixed but it's a state of charge that we can play with and utilize for the um, controller and we have the differential equation for it and we have the constraints on the control and we have the limitations on the state of charge we look at this optimal control problem and we would like to solve them that is what we are going to develop now with the help of Pontryagin's minimum principle and we will close it with the ECMS strategy. Pathways to solve optimal control problems are highlighted here in terms of solving them numerically. We have the hamilton jacobi bellman equation which result in the dynamic programming where we are building up the cost to go function and we have that curse of dimensionality and here in the middle we have what's called indirect methods. We are not directly looking at the optimization, but we are looking at conditions for optimality. And that's Pontryagin's maximum principle. Then there are these direct methods that is quite popular now, thanks to the evolution of the computers and their capabilities of solving kind of problems that we would like to solve as engineers. I said it before, there are courses on optimal control and at Linköping University it's the TSRT08 where some of these methods are covered in more detail. The main message is that there is a vast literature base 
with different methods that can be used to solve these kind of problems. And a lot of developments are being done right now. They are being done especially on the numerical side, on the discrete points here, to follow the utilization of the computational power that we are getting available. Here we have a general optimal control problem formulation where we have our Lagrange function, our L here, and we have our differential equation. In the optimal control theory, much of the development goes back to this Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is a function that is defined like this. It's the L from the Lagrangian, and it's lambda times the right-hand side of the differential equation. And this lambda is sometimes called Lagrange multiplier. And it's a dear child with many names. It's sometimes called the Lagrange variable, the adjoint state, the co-state, and most often in literature it's denoted lambda. But also mu is used, and you have seen also w in some slides back. Compared to normal optimization, lambda was a constant for each constraint, but now since the constraint is a differential equation, this lambda becomes time variable. So we take this Hamiltonian and we will look at what the theory says for optimality. Hamiltonian was this one just repeated up here. And the necessary conditions for optimality is, of course, we need to fulfill the original system dynamics. Otherwise, we are not fulfilling the requirements of the system. Then the adjoint variable or the Lagrange variable need to fulfill this differential equation. And this is something that can be utilized when solving the optimal control problems that you will see here. At the optimum, where the optimum is prescribed that we have the state x, we have the control u, and we have the adjoint state lambda. At the optimum, the optimal selection of control is always smaller or equal to the Hamiltonian of any other u. And this is something that is called the Pontryagin's minimum principle or Pontryagin's maximum principle, depending on if we're studying a minimization problem or a maximization problem. And the thing that we can do then is if we have the optimal x and we have the optimal lambda, then we can just minimize the Hamiltonian with respect to u to get this optimal control variable. One thing that we will see later here is that if we can find something that gives a simple expression for lambda that we can insert here, then we can create our optimal state trajectory by utilizing differential equation forward. And where we are in each step, we are solving this function and we're inserting this optimal function up here. So we are using this to generate our x star, provided that we have lambda star. So, what can we do to find this lambda star? For the parallel hybrid electric vehicle in a driving cycle, and this can be generalized to other systems also. For example, it is well suited for the Chevrolet Volt vehicle that's of a power split type. When the cycle is given, we have that power demand from the powertrain and it's given. And we want to minimize the fuel energy. It will be the same thing as minimizing the fuel consumption in total because it's just a constant between mass of fuel and energy of fuel. And that's the heating value of the fuel. So we're minimizing this term that you can see down here now. Then we have the freedom to use the electrochemical energy from the battery, which is our control signal. Then the final value should be the same as the initial value. So here we have a hard constraint. And then we have an algebraic constraint here at the bottom, which is just an equation that says that the powertrain power demand must be fulfilled by either the fuel power through its efficiency or the electric power through the efficiency of the electric path. This is a constraint that needs to be fulfilled over the driving cycle. And if we look at real-time control, the driver 
is requesting the propulsive force or if we go to autonomous vehicles in the future it will be the planning algorithm that is requesting this power demand and we have to fulfill it and the freedom we have is to select if it's from fuel and combustion engine or if it's from the battery which is electrochemical energy and electrochemical power. How do we solve this now with optimal control? start by setting up the Hamiltonian. So we take our fuel power and then we take our joint variable times the differential equation times the right hand side of the differential equation. How to solve this now with optimal control? We will construct the Hamiltonian by taking the Lagrange function which is pf here and then we take the Lagrange variable times the right hand side of the differential equation. This is the Hamiltonian, as I said, fuel power, and then lambda times the right-hand side of the differential equation, and we have the minus sign from the differential equation. And now we use the necessary condition for the adjoint state, and the necessary condition was to differentiate the Hamiltonian with respect to x and see what happens. What we get then is that we get the differential we differentiate the electrochemical energy and we differentiate the battery voltage with state of charge here. The only thing that depends on state of charge in this one is the voltage. So we use the rules of differentiation and we get the following where we have this squared term here and we have gotten this minus sign from that. But the most important thing is that we have this derivative of u with respect to the state of charge. Now let's have a look at that function and the typical characteristics here for these LFP batteries was that we didn't have very much sensitivity in the voltage with respect to the state of charge. So if we have this flat characteristics and we're operating in the normal region then we don't have very much. A good model for normal operation is to say that the derivative of the open circuit voltage with respect to the state of charge is zero. So we are relying upon that this is a flat liner. The derivative is, is small in relation to uh, the other in relation to the other components in the equations. So what does this say when we come to the necessary conditions? Well it says that the derivative of the joint variable is zero which means that the lambda becomes a constant so it's not a complete time varying uh, variable but it's just a single constant so the thing that we need to determine now is this lambda uh, and the solution that uh, we go about to use this explicit minimization so the solution algorithm that you can follow if you want to use this is that we have all the models for the vehicle and engine with fuel flow and power electronics and electric machine and the battery. You set up all the equations and form the Hamiltonian and then you make a guess on this constant lambda. Then with the drive cycle simulation, so you simulate through the drive cycle with your vehicle where you in each step minimize that Hamiltonian to get your U star. If Charles sustainability is fulfilled then you stop. If it's not fulfilled then you have to modify lambda and you change it so you update it and then you run it again so you iterate here until you have charge sustainability. One way of seeing this for the hybrid is that the driving cycle is mapped to a lambda zero so for each driving cycle there will be an optimal lambda zero and this optimal lambda zero can be found by doing this iteration. But then we come to the question that's posed here. What if we don't have lambda zero and we would like to use it in an online scenario like when we're out driving normally? The thing that we will notice is that if lambda zero is incorrect then the state of charge will start to drift away from its nominal SOC. For example if we call the nominal SOC for SOC ref, so that's our reference SOC. This SOC ref could be either like 50% or in the plug-in hybrid we could use a reference trajectory for the SOC. So the solution then is 
We make a good initial guess by studying a lot of different cycles and we see what is the most probable lambda value. But while we are driving, we start updating this lambda value and we are trying to update it in a way so that it will be close to the SOC ref. And to update lambda, we can use a PI controller. So we're continuously adjusting it depending on how much we are deviating from the reference value. And this is then called adaptive ECMS because the lambda is adapted while we are driving. So lambda can then be adapted to the driving cycle. One thing to mention here is that uh, the lambda here will then be a result of the previous driving. So if you make a big change in your behavior while you're out driving, then you might see a change in the state of charge for a while until this adaptive scheme has adapted to your new driving style. But the fine thing with this is that you can control it so that you get your SOC reference in a systematic way and you have equations all the way to base the solution upon. So this was what's done in the theory. Prior to the theory was developed with the Pontryagin's minimum principle. It was the result of an engineering solution and that engineering solution was developed based upon that you use this penalty on the state of charge Q. And you look at it, for example, in a special case initially, we said that the slope of that function should be minus W. So that was the weight that we used. Then the hybrid vehicle developers looked at this weight that depends a little bit on if we do discharge or charge. Different weights were used in charging and discharging. Then the scaling factor was introduced by studying the energy levels between the heating value of the fuel and the size of the battery, like the energy of the battery. And then this scaling factor was given this S and this S here was then called the equivalent consumption minimization strategy because it's trying to make a way between how valuable is electricity in relation to the chemical energy in the tank? And it was used in many engineering reports and developed further and refined further by studying the different energy paths. So you're studying different modes here. I won't go through these, but you can look at them to see the fuel efficiency and the electrical efficiency and see how they are being related to each other. You can determine the equivalence factors by just performing simulations and you set them to different values and you know whether or not you have a charge sustaining strategy. Run it with constant controls to see if you are depleting the battery you are going in this direction and if you are increasing the state of charge you are going in this direction. So then you can get a relation between them from an engineering perspective. This is an example of when the application came first and then the theory was developed to explain it. I did this the other way around in my lecture here. I showed you the theory and then I came to how it was applied originally, where the word equivalents come from. It was a way to try to evaluate the value of the electricity. So in terms of the fuel cost, so you could balance these two against each other. The implementation is that you have your model for the vehicle that we talked about. You go in with the energy here. You have your lambdas and you get your S. And from this S you look at your Hamiltonian. And if it's minimum then you know that you have your optimum. Or if it's not minimum then you go back and go through this flow chart again. Until you have found your optimal control signal. And there is also a telemetry ECMS that's described in the book. So you add map data to this so that S becomes adjusted in relation to the future driving. The next step now is to look at plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. For plug-in hybrid electric vehicles I have already described the charge depletion, charge sustain strategy. Where you first do the charge depletion and then you do the charge sustenance to not deplete the battery more than necessary. Then you have the blended trajectory where you 
can utilize the electric energy more cleverly and get access to better fuel economy. But that relies upon knowledge about where your destination is. If you don't know the destination, then it's better to utilize the energy. So for example, if the drive cycle ends here and you have SOC up here, then you haven't utilized all the potential that you had in your plugged in battery. Hopefully you can understand that uh, there is a big a push towards finding more information about the driving profile. What will the driving profile be that we're in currently and utilizing that information for optimization. It's an opportunity for the car manufacturers to offer benefits in terms of fuel economy if you have that kind of information available. So here is an example of five different commuter tracks for a car. Based on this you can calculate the state of charge trajectory as a reference based on either a detailed model or a simplified model of the powertrain. I will show the reference where this was done. Then we have a PI controller that is used to follow this SOC reference. You can use a little bit more theory that's done also. For example a dynamic programming cost to go can be implemented. All drivings are not the uh, same. There is some variation due to traffic and you see some stop traffic and you see some stop until you come into your final destination. So the SOC reference trajectory is uh, then run in a software platform autonomy that can be used to evaluate different drive cycles and get the fuel economy for this spread. A comparison is made for the same driving cycle with charge depletion, charge sustain strategy, the plug-in vehicle. And the results from these comparisons show that if you have a detailed SOC reference trajectory, you get uh, this fuel economy. If you have a simplified, you get actually a little bit better in terms of fuel economy, but you have used a little bit extra electricity, so the SOC is slightly smaller. In uh, the dynamic programming cost to go, you have the smallest fuel and you have used most electricity. And then you have the charge depletion, charge sustain. But the most important thing is to see that the charge depletion, charge sustained is significantly higher than all the other ones. And it hasn't used much less of the battery than the other ones. And it has also used higher currents which stresses the battery more. And if you're interested in this you can see that you have 6.8 to 9% improvements in fuel economy with the blended strategies. And you can read more about it in this paper. And with that we have come to the summary. Optimal control can help us with planning of complex system trajectories as you have seen from the initial part and it can increase understanding of the system and act as an eye opener and an art is to select the right method for the problem which is something you learn while you work on the problem. So you have dynamic programming, we have Pontryagin's maximum principle, there is numerical optimal control and it's MPC or receding horizon control. This is an example of how we can use modeling, system analysis and optimization to get efficient, drivable and clean vehicles. With that I've come to the conclusion of this lecture and hope to see you in the next lecture. Bye bye!